social workers are as strong as our resources. So what are some of the resources? Because there's so many people, Ms. Reese, that either they don't, they misinformed or they don't read, they don't know. They don't even think in, there's any help for them. So what are some of the resources for a person that is really downtrodden? Thanks for tuning in to Conversations with Betty Lamar, coming to you live from the Bluff City. And now, your host, Betty Lamar. Now, for our viewing audience, tell everybody exactly who you are as it relates to our topic of discussion this evening. Okay. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. My background is in mental health and health care. I'm also an expert witness where expert witnesses well, testify at trials based on specific knowledge and social work that is relevant to cases and also, as you say, a private practitioner. Okay. Mm -hmm. So look, Cheryl, let's talk about the history of social work in the United States. How, tell us a little bit about the history and then we want to know why you chose to become a social worker. A social worker in the United States, it started with dealing with poverty. Most, m many people were in poverty during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, a lot of people came to this country because America was experience, experiencing an economic growth. And when people came here from other states and even migrated from other countries, there were a lot of social problems such as poverty, disease, legal issues, violence, and other social afflictions. So the settlement movement began. And the settlement movement focused on the causes of poverty through research, reform, and residence. And out of that, there was a need for educational resources, legal services, and health care services. Okay, so let me ask you something. Is there a difference working with, say, inner city uh, patients versus working with the burbs? Mm -hmm. Are they different? Well, people experience the same social problems, uh, trouble, adversity, uh, social issues. They, they know everybody's address. And you know, at times, you know, people can be doing well and have situations where uh, misfortune and uh, they're ending up in t times and seasons in their lives where they don't have a lot of resources or they may be going through a difficult time. So therefore, you know, social services will be needed. And many of the services are temporary. Uh, some services are uh, for people who are, have chronic issues, it's long-term services, but assistance is usually temporary. Now let me ask you this. What is, just to name a few, the roles of a social worker in a healthcare setting? Oh, well, there are various roles. It depends on what type of work we're doing. I would like to preface by giving you a lot of examples of different jobs social workers are employed in. Uh, they're, we're employed in healthcare administration, employee assistance programs, hospitals, outpatient medical facilities, nursing homes, hospices, uh, drug and re drug rehabilitation centers, and mental health centers. In the uh, medical setting, social workers, we normally do effective discharge planning. When people come into uh, the hospital, their lives are changing or have has changed drastically based on their diagnosis. And discharge planning is, it starts at the beginning and is ongoing. And uh, what we do is look at the person's level of care that they may need and the available resources that they may have or may need additional resources. Because we don't want the care to be fragmented. We want them to have a smooth transition. Uh, we also educate the patient and the family on the disease process, prevention, and disease management. So we want you know, them to succeed and have continuity of health care. What training do you have to deal with the mentally ill? Because you do have to deal with it, because a lot of them are homeless. Mm -hmm. Well, I do have extensive you know, training in mental health uh, that's taught you know, in our courses in graduate school, uh, different pharmacology medications and human behavior in the social environment and uh, different uh, uh, mental illness and addictive behaviors. Uh, in a hospital setting, what we find is uh, mental illness is, is, is commonplace because according to the U.S. Surgeon General, 44 million Americans suffer from mental illness and, and it, it's on the rise and the reasons are unclear but many people suffer with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, erratic behavior, panic disorders and depression. 
Uh, and social workers in the mental health field who are clinically trained provide most services. 60% of mental health services are provided by licensed clinical social workers compared to 10% psychiatrists, 23% psychologists, mm -hmm. and 5% um, uh, 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 psychiatric nurses. Okay. Now, when we're um, working with people who are diagnosed with mental illness, we know that those behaviors are indicative of uh, a need or a want. Um, and what we try to do when, when I meet with a person, uh, they might present with fear, uh, anger, frustration, depressed mood. I, I try to find out what is the need, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. uh, and I look for warning signs if the person uh, is a little bit uh, more, uh, you know, rigid or shouting or cursing, then I know that we need, uh, may need a little intervention. But I try to find out what the need is. And once the need is identified, we see what we can do to meet the need. And as far as the medication compliance, that's very important with mm -hmm. mental illness. And there are a lot of reasons why people, uh, you know, diagnosed with mental illness uh, do not follow up. And I have several examples for it, and I can start with some of those. Okay. Uh, when, sometimes when people are on medication and they feel better, they terminate the medication uh, without doctor's uh, consent or authorization because they feel better. Some people, uh, they don't take the medication at all because they are in denial about having a mental illness because it comes with stigma. It's true, especially yes. in the black community. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. If you say you're mentally ill or gay, I mean, you're subject to be thrown out of your own home. So you walk around not getting the help and resources you need for mm -hmm. fear of they may know. Mm -hmm. You know, they may be afraid of me. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm so glad you said that. Mm -hmm. And you can continue. Yeah, and other examples, um, sometimes uh, people, they don't understand the medication itself or the treatment that, uh, it, treatment requires follow-up. Uh, and some, some uh, mental illnesses, you can treat it with medication, but you deal with it through social skills. What about the mental Ill, mentally ill patients that refuse treatment? Because you can't obviously go home with them. What do you all do with those people? They're in and out, and you know they're not taking their medicine. We encourage con continuity of health care. We encourage follow-up appointments. And we understand why they are non-compliant. It's, it's several re reasons, as I alluded to earlier. Also, you know, good problem-solving skills. People don't recognize the warning signs of stressors, you know, stress that's a you know that we take on ourselves yeah and also uh, I know about that <laughs> and also um, people ha don't know how to have the ability to say no sometimes and cannot understand the warning signs of relapse when we're talking about people who uh, have substance abuse issues a lot goes into trying to make sure that we are doing all that we can you know it's a hard thing to change people, places, and things. It's mm -hmm. a hard thing to rely on others for uh, different resources like transportation and when money is short, you know, you ask other people for money to help with, you know, your medicines. It's hard to do that sometimes, but there are consequences for noncompliance and mental, people who are diagnosed with mental illness end up incarcerated, mm -hmm. homeless, victimized. Yeah, they are victims, you know, they are taken advantage of. Um, sometimes it leads to a lot of comorbid illnesses. Okay. Mm -hmm. So social workers are as strong as our resources. So what are some of the resources? Well, just a few, to name a few, what are some of the resources that people that need the resources have available to them? Because there's so many people, Miss Reese, that either they don't, they misinformed or they don't read, they don't know. They don't even think there, there's any help for them. So what are some of the resources for a person that is really downtrodden? Mm -hmm. um, the Hope uh, Foundation, uh, have a bit of it for everybody. That, that way we can help the community. This is the Homeless Organizing for Power and Equality. Okay. This is published annually, uh, sometimes biannually. Okay. Uh, this is a booklet with all kinds of resources from homeless shelters to uh, libraries, um, uh, resources for uh, victims of uh, domestic violence, mm. 
we have in this book a lot of resources for uh, people who need treatment, substance abuse treatment. And Jim Brown is one of the people that um, works with this uh, organization, and he's a person I call upon. He's my go-to person because he provides me with a lot of resources from this uh, booklet. And it's uh, uh, sponsored by the City of Memphis and the Peace and Justice Center with the bridge. Okay. And they give out numerous uh, booklets, you know, whatever hospitals or other agencies may need because that way, you know, the community can be informed and we're all on the same page.